You're listening to the Thrive Works webcast, where you hear facts, not fluff. Introducing your host, Dr. Anthony Centaur. You're here with Anthony Centaur and Stacy Franklin. Stacy Franklin is a licensed clinical mental health therapist practicing out of Thrive Works in Peachtree City, Georgia, which is just south of Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, Stacy has been uh, featured twice in the national television show with the doctors, and she has been working with a client uh, who previously ate uh, chalk and bowls of baby powder every day. Uh, so the first segment on the doctors, they were talking about this client, how devastating uh, her pica disorder was to her life. And in the second story, uh, it was a, a celebratory uh, episode of the doctors where they did a follow up. And Stacy's client is now chalk free and baby powder free. So um, we're very excited, Stacy, to have you here on the show today. Thank you. And uh, let's just dive right in because I think pica is one of those uh, disorders that really captures the imagination. People have a lot of questions about it. They don't understand it. It just seems uh, alien. Um, can you tell us what is pica disorder from a clinical perspective? So pica actually falls in the DSM under the feeding and eating disorders um, section. And pica is... Um, eating non-substantive or non-nutritional, non-food items. Um, oftentimes, uh, those items will be things, uh, actually it could be anything, it could be anything from the chalk and the baby powder to more severe cases where people actually eat um, pieces of glass or sponges. Um, there's even been cases as severe as people eating um, the cushions on furniture. So okay. it, it is defined as eating non-nutritious, uh, non-food items. Now, why would someone want to eat glass? Well, oftentimes the patients, if they have ruled out um, any medical or other mental health issues, right? So oftentimes if the body is craving um, iron or zinc or um, other minerals, then the patient will crave things like dirt, like oftentimes even chalk or some of those things so that they can recover those those minerals that their body is needing. Now chalk um, is calcium, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, however, Oh, there's also uh, mental health disorders, intellectual disabilities, or um, oftentimes uh, autism spectrum. Mm -hmm. uh, individuals will eat those items as part of that disorder, um, not necessarily understanding um, that that those items are not um healthy or nutritious. So that's a rule out then is that's what you're saying. So out. if you're a developmentally disabled person, you don't know that it's not food, it's not pica, it's you just, it's something it, else. It could be sitting in, in the middle of a different disorder. Right. Um, but when it is pica, typically they have been eating those um, items for more than an, uh, a month and often shows up in uh, childhood, but it could show up at any point, but oftentimes in childhood. And, uh, the, the person is often dealing with emotional trauma or unresolved um, feelings. Oftentimes it could be grief, it could be, but there's something that's underlying it. And it just shows up in the form of eating an item that provides comfort for them. Hmm. Now help us to to cross that bridge or build that bridge for us, if it's even if it's even possible, if we can if we can make sense of it, how does a sense of grief or a sense of emotional pain turn into something like eating popsicle sticks or eating something that which is pica? How, how do we make how do we bridge that gap? That's a great question, and um, so I have worked with clients that have experienced childhood trauma. Okay oftentimes including abandonment and abuse. Um, and 
the item or the the substance that they begin to eat, they find a source of comfort and security and it becomes consistent for them. Mm -hmm. So throughout their trauma or throughout their childhood, when they weren't able to count on, say, a primary um, source of support for protection or for that comforting feeling, they were able to consistently count on that substance. And it became a form of addiction for them because mm-hmm. of that comfort, uh, that comforting feeling. So the behavior starts early then, typically. Someone doesn't pick up pica in middle age. That's usually they've been doing it since they were very young. They can, and for different reasons. Again, if the body is craving some sort of mineral um, or, you know, there's a deficiency in that way, they can actually start there. And even after the deficiency is corrected, they may continue because now they have formed this habit Mm -hmm. um, and formed a learned behavior of finding comfort in that particular substance. So yeah, you can actually pick up pica at any stage of your life, but predominantly we see it happening um, in early childhood. And that would be after, you know, the age of two or three, um, you know, once the, uh, I guess, normal childhood progression um, has passed of, you know, kids putting things in their mouths and, you know, picking things up off the floor and, and you know, being curious and, and eating it as part of normal childhood development. Mm-hmm. So we won't typically see a diagnosis until after maybe the age of three, sometimes four. I see. You know, with a lot of clinical mental health disorders, there is sort of like a subclinical aspect that people can relate to. Like if, if you, have, you have depression, which some people just don't not, they've never experienced depression. It's hard to really know how debilitating depression is and, and how severe it is, but they know what unhappiness is. Or uh, an anxiety disorder, they might have never experienced anything so drastic, but they know what stress is. Is there, is there something subclinical that the general population can relate to? uh as it as it applies to pica and 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 it might not be it might just be not to answer my own question but it might just be binge eating or overeating or something like that but is there anything else um you know obsessive compulsive disorder um or addiction will have very similar um needs to to act on a behavior that you know is not healthy for you, that you know is harmful Mm -hmm. to you. Um, In this case with PICA, oftentimes those patients um, want to stop the behavior, um, but don't know how to, don't know how to deal with what's underlying um, so that they can name what they're feeling and be able to address those things and move on. Um, oftentimes people with pica are going to be experiencing bowel um, obstruction or um, you know intestinal damage and things like that where in and even with the case on the doctors um, that patient Tania was experiencing excruciating pain yeah um, and physical she, pain uh, as physical, well as emotional pain yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, She was much more aware of the physical pain than she was the emotional pain, of course. Um, And she talked about the moment that she realized she needed help is when she was sitting in the bathroom on the toilet, bent over, excruciating pain um, and eating a box of chalk at the same time. Mm. Um, So, you know, there's that um, that the uh, obsession and compulsive this. behaviors that you know she wants to stop them but she can't the same thing in in terms of someone that has been addicted to drugs who are addicted to what how the drugs make them feel but understand um that it is it is not good for them that it is harmful uh to them and to their their families as well Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the thing we have to keep in mind, if, if we want to relate to something like pica, from what you're saying, is that the experience of eating the chalk is comforting. It's, it's sort of like cutting. It's hard for us to 
understand that for those who have maladaptive cutting behaviors, the experience of cutting isn't pain, it's pleasure, it's relief, it's uh, excitement, it's something positive. And if we can kind of get our mind around that, I think we can kind of get our mind around um, what motivates someone. Yeah, I think what you said, so it's comfort, it's security, and it is um, consistent Mm. in our lives. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, kids display pica, something people don't really think about, right? But can you, uh, you had brought it up. Can you talk about some ways that we see pica naturally displayed in our, in our children? Oh, um, sure. I mean, from the time a baby is able to, um, reach, you know, get their foot and reach it into their mouth and they are, you know, (laughs) gnawing on their toes, um, that's very normal childhood behavior all the way up till, you know, your toddlers that are, um, that are curious and wanting to put, you know, pennies in their mouths and, and, uh, eating dirt and eating sand at the beach and all of those mm-hmm. things, um, in an older child or an, a, an adult, even that would be, um, abnormal uh, behavior. And mm-hmm. we would, be concerned, but in children that are, um, you know, three years and younger, that's just normal part of their development. Yeah, kid, kids are kids are a mess, right? Yeah, so yeah, shoving <laughs> sand in their mouth. I can I can remember going to the beach and just handfuls of sand, and it and right. it comes out the other end, and it is disgusting. Yep. Exactly, my grandkids yeah. were found under the table eating dog treats. You know? Oh, yep. Like, hey, the dog eats it, so this is the behavior I'm supposed to exhibit. Right. Johnny, Johnny's eating glue. It's still right. the third grade. Johnny's still eating glue. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, uh, in the segment on the doctors, I know. I mean, it's whenever it's on TV, it goes by so quick. And uh, but you had you had mentioned uh, something which just was seemed really really interesting. You had said that something about uh, your your client had she most enjoyed the first bite of a piece of chalk in the last bite. And Mm -hmm. you had told her, uh, what, throw away the center? Yes. So Tania was very, very nervous about starting the therapeutic process and um, did not necessarily believe that she would ever be able to overcome it. And because she was so new to therapy and had not picked up any of the coping skills that she would later learn, it was important to not completely deprive her of that comforting feeling. Mm. So we decided to not focus initially on um, eliminating her consumption of chalk and baby powder, but to begin changing the relationship with it um, a little bit at a time. So we, I asked her, you know, what days, is, does she consume the most chalk? And she said probably Sundays because, you know, she was working five and six days a week. Sunday, she was usually off. She was usually alone, had more time to herself to um, to think, you know, and to worry even. So, so Sundays were her, um, you know, biggest consumption days, although she would go through sometimes six boxes of chalk on a, any given day. Yeah. Um, but Sundays were probably the most difficult if she had to name one. These are, that's a, I mean, that's a lot of anything. I and mean, if, if, if it was six boxes of chocolate, it would be a lot, but this is six boxes of chalk. That is a, I mean, if, if you think, I mean, I'm thinking about the size of a box of chalk. It's, I mean, that's a, it's a lot of anything to consume. Yeah. yeah. And she described it as eating a bag of chips. Mm. Yeah. Um, but she, so Sundays were usually her, her toughest days. And then we talked about the emotional feelings that she got, uh, that she had when eating the chalk. And I got her to describe that. And what we learned is that it was, it was the craving that would be satisfied um, on that very first bite of chalk. And then she talked about the last bite of chalk also being most satisfying. And so we came up with a contract and with a plan that said, Sundays is your chalk day and you get to eat chalk on Sundays. Um, and 
but instead of eating, you can eat the whole box of chalk because that, that was important to her. It's like, you know, are you going to take away, you know, three of my six boxes of chalk? And mm -hmm. so we didn't want to take away that comfort or what those boxes of chalk represented to her, mm -hmm. but we wanted to begin to, to decrease it. And so I, in our contract, we said, hey, Sundays is your chalk day. You can line your six boxes of chalk up. Um, but here's the difference. You're going to have that first bite. You're going to break off the end um, for the last bite. And the middle, which is less satisfying to you, you're going to toss it. And she agreed to that. And um, it didn't take her long to get to the point where she was no longer looking forward to chalk days on Sunday and she wasn't having the same level of satisfaction. You know, you would think, you know, often if you think about people who are struggling, you know, with diets or struggling mm -hmm. with addiction and they know that, you know, come the weekends, I get to, you know, eat it up or booze it up or, you know, smoke it up or whatever that is, they look forward to it and they really do binge. Yeah. Her behavior was actually the opposite. Um, I think once she began to gain confidence in herself that this is actually something that she may be able to overcome, then Sundays and six boxes of chalk were no longer as satisfying to her. That's fascinating. Uh, and with the with the baby powder. Uh, how was there a weaning process for that too? Or was that secondary to the chalk? The baby powder was secondary to the chalk. Yeah. And so it was interesting because the chalk was, you could, it wasn't just any chalk. So there was a certain brand of chalk. I mean, she is a chalk connoisseur. <laughs> she got the good chalk. She got the good chalk, <laughs> right? So there's a certain consistency that she craved. And uh -huh brand of chalk doesn't provide that and so um she would actually go and buy you know the store where she knew she could get that brand of chalk um she would travel if she had to to get the number of boxes that she needed mm -hmm. um baby's powder was secondary in the short-term absence of chalk I see. I see. Did she, uh, you know, this is an interesting situation because, I mean, typically we, we were never able to talk about cases. And this is a case that, of course, has been aired on, on national television. So there's, you know, there's, of course, some things you need to keep confidential. But in general, it's OK to say, yes, I saw this client because the, the jig is up. It's, it's bad on TV. Um, was there ever any discomfort, like going to the store to I think people are just going to be interested, like, uh to, to get the chalk, was that a, a normal process for her or was that an area of shame or was that were people, did it raise any eyebrows when she was checking out every week with, with, a, with a, a pile of chalk boxes? Yeah. Um, no, I don't think she was as concerned during the buying process, mm. but it was um, a habit or an addiction that she hid from others. Mm. So, you know, she, and she talks about this on the show, she was a nurse. And so, you know, in her nurse uh, lab jackets, there's big deep pockets. And so, you know, her pockets would always be secretively filled with, you know, in addition to pens and stethoscopes or what have you, she's got her boxes of chalk. And so she, um, she did not share and she, she, it was more um, self inflicted shame that she experienced. Mm. Um, versus, you know, worried about what people thought when she was buying the chalk. Fair uh, enough. Yeah. Fair enough. We might have some, I'm sure we will at some point, we'll have some listeners or some viewers who are in this uh, situation themselves, if not with chalk, perhaps with something else. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give to someone uh, who's who's looking to get better, who's looking to get some help? I think it would be the same advice I'd give to anyone who um, felt that they were not, you know, they were not functioning at their best self. Um, and that is not to suffer in silence, to um, reach out for help. 
what's interesting, I think my message would be more geared toward um, clinicians and therapists and, and practitioners because what's interesting in the way that the doctors, the, was they were connected with me is that they knew they were bringing this client on and they had made calls to centers that were that specialize in you know eating disorders or they or um you know uh clinicians that you know their websites say hey we specialize in eating disorders but when they reached out to them they were those those facilities were not comfortable with the word pica. There yeah. was um, not enough knowledge about pica, and not thinking through that. There's it's showing up in the form. It's the symptom uh, or the the outcome of something much deeper. Once you rule those other um, concerns out, the medical concerns, the you know, um, autism spectrum, intellectual dis disabilities, when you rule those things out, then PICA really is showing up um, as a symptom of something else. Yeah, that make that makes sense. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, so yeah, they, they did that. You had said that before they'd reach out to a lot of people, nobody wanted to touch it, nobody wanted to take on this case. And if if there is someone listening, or, or there, there will be, I know there will be, uh, they might be experiencing the same problem, that they're trying to reach out to help and that counselors are, are uh, too afraid to, to take on the challenge. So I guess maybe this is a call to clinicians as well to get, get yourself in gear and learn about this because this is a, something that people are struggling with. And, and I mean, there's some disorders that, that rise and decline in, I don't want to say popularity, but in incidence, you know, cutting seems to be one that has been rising and pica may be one that's been, that's be rising, which means us as clinicians, we have a responsibility to learn a bit about it or learn as much as we can about it. And uh, because we're going to have clients and we're here to help them. You know, one of the things I didn't mention, too, is there are some people that would fall under, um, would meet the criteria of, of PICA, um, but it's, but their eating of, you know, non-nutritious items, it's more cultural. So I don't know if you know this, but in the South, there's still places in, you know, Alabama and rural Georgia um, where the little side mom and pop gas stations or country stores will still still sell bags of dirt um, or bags of starch um, because that's a behavior and that's you know it's kind of like chewing tobacco um, but eating you know red clay or eating dirt is you know, it's something that has been generational that, you know, people have done just, it's just as common as smoking a cigarette or chewing tobacco or dipping snuff. Or chewing gum. Yeah. Or chewing gum. Yeah. So, um, in that way, they would actually meet the criteria of PICA, but it's not interfering with the, their daily course of life. Yeah. It's not um, interfering or is it at a point where it is um, damaging them physically or or they're not experiencing the damage that it's doing to them physically? Mm. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. I mm -hmm. guess on my next road trip south, I'm going to keep my eyes open, <laughs> see if I can get my hands on some good chewing dirt. <laughs> You're going to have to get out of the, you know, out of the comfort zone of Metro Atlanta, experience right. the real south. That's right. <laughs> Um, Stacy, how can people get a hold of you? Oh, thank you for asking. Um, of course, they can, you know, visit our website, which is thriveworks.com forward slash peachtree hyphen city hyphen counseling mm -hmm. is certainly one way. Um, they can certainly give us a call directly. Um, if they want to reach my cell phone number, that's 770-765-7099. Or if they're ready to commit to scheduling their first appointment, we'd love to have that as well. And they can call 678-383-1210 and follow the prompts. Excellent. Everyone, Stacey Franklin, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Bye.